All right, welcome everybody to today's live webinar, Intro to the Internet Part 2. Um, as you may have heard, we had a part one last week and that will be available on our YouTube channel soon. We'll send out the link for that when it's ready. But before we get started, I want to introduce myself. My name is Rebecca Van Dusen and I am a library associate here at the Champaign Public Library. If you've attended any tech workshops, you've probably seen me helping with those. I also occasionally teach a class. And I also work at the information desk, so you've probably seen me if you're in the library. And before I, I introduce our technology librarian, Susan Winkler, I'd like to mention some of the Zoom features available to you. So if you hover your mouse near the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see some controls pop up. So starting at the bottom left, you can adjust your audio settings, like changing your speaker or microphone. If you move towards the bottom center of your screen, you'll see a chat bubble and a raise hand button. So if you use the chat option, then that will send a chat message to me while Susan's doing her demonstrations and going over the handout. You can always ask questions via chat and I can help answer those and also pose them to Susan during the webinar. So feel free to write in the chat. There's also a raise hand option. So that's useful if you're wanting to speak your question rather than writing it in the chat. So either one of those are fine during any of the time of the webinar. Don't feel like you're interrupting us. We're here to answer those questions. So please ask if you have them. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I have to cover. And of course we are open. Uh, you can stop by and ask questions as well. You can also email us, chat with us online through our website, or of course you can call us too. Um, but let me go ahead and introduce our technology librarian, Susan Winkler. How are you today, Susan? Hi, Rebecca, I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Great, glad to hear it. Uh, I will mention too that uh, for those of you attending today, we do not see your video um, since this is the webinar format, uh, so you don't have to worry about being on camera at all. Uh, if you do want to ask that question, a question out loud, um, like Rebecca said, go ahead and raise your hand and then she'll, she'll basically call on you um, and you'll want to unmute your microphone and then you can ask your question verbally too. Um, but you can always put stuff in the chat too. We're, we're watching that as well. Um, and today's webinar, uh, we are doing our Intro to the Internet Part 2 class today. Um, part 1 was last week. Um, as Rebecca said, we will put that video up on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so if you want, you can watch, you can watch both of them and uh, we will send a link out to everybody and we'll send it out with some follow-up questions and a copy of today's handout, which um, Rebecca will also put uh, the link to the handout in the chat um, in a few minutes here. Uh, so yep, you can I'm, follow. I'm working on that right now. <laughs> so you can follow along if you'd like. Uh, I will go ahead and share my screen to get us started. Uh, and let me pick the right screen here so that we're in our PowerPoint. And we'll go ahead and go to slideshow view and from the beginning. Okay, so I'm hoping everybody can see Intro to the Internet Part 2. Yes. And here are the things we're going to cover today. So last, uh, in Part 1, we spend a lot of time talking about navigating the Internet, what it is, and then how to get started with um, going to websites and some terms related to websites and browsing the web. Um, and then we talk a little bit, very, very briefly about some of the things you can do to customize your experience. Um, and we're going to get into more detail with that today. Uh, but one of the main things we, and one of the main reasons we split this into two sessions is that there's just so much to cover regarding privacy, safety, and security when you're online. Uh, that we decided it was a good idea to split this into two workshops where we could spend some time on the basics of the internet and searching and finding what you're looking for, and then some time spent on privacy and security, um, best practices, some things to be aware of, and uh, kind of the customization of your browsers and settings. Okay, so our agenda for today, we're going to talk about safety and security. We'll talk about passwords. Um, autofilling passwords and something called two-factor authentication. Uh, we'll talk about public Wi-Fi networks and virtual private networks, also known as VPNs. Uh, we'll talk about how to detect suspicious emails, um, suspicious links, and what to do on social sites that, or what not to do really, um, on social sites like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, part of the 
unfortunately, part of being on the internet is also being aware of those bad actors and what they might be trying to do, um, including things like malware, adware, spyware, and ransomware. And we'll go over what those four things are and um, some of the ways that you can uh, protect yourself and uh, notice or detect them. Um, some of it you can't, you don't necessarily, um, it's kind of hidden, so you won't necessarily know that it's there. Um, but there are some things you can do to help minimize the risk. Okay. And we'll talk about how to customize your browsers and settings. And if you remember from last week, we talked about how your browser is going to be some, is going to be Google Chrome, uh, Firefox, Safari, uh, Microsoft Edge, or Internet Explorer. And there's some others out there as well. Uh, and those are your browsers. And then you have search engines, and they're, they're different things. So your browser is the program you use to get to the internet. And then your search engine is what you're going to use to, to search for something that you're looking for on the internet. And those things are different, and they operate independently of each other. Uh, so today, we're going to spend some time talking about how you can get, you can make one um, a default browser, which means it's the one that's always going to open or always going to be the first browser that you use for something. Same with the search engine. Uh, we're going to talk about how to customize your startup <clears throat> and your homepage so that whenever you get online, if you want to see a, for, uh, a specific site first, you will always see that specific site first. I will talk a little bit about extensions and what those are. Um, basically, they are um, plugins or things that you can add to your browser to make the experience um, more to your liking. And then we'll talk a little bit about private browsing and incognito mode, which is kind of a fancy way of saying uh, some of the stuff that you do is less visible to others. Okay. And then we'll spend some time with troubleshooting. Okay. All right. Any questions before we begin? I don't see any so far. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start talking about passwords. So, um, Recently, there's been kind of a, a move toward having passwords that are longer, because if it's longer, it takes more time for someone to crack it um, using, um, you know, computer generated code that then basically tries to guess what your password is. So the longer your password, the better um, in regards to that kind of um, attack that you might experience. Uh, and here are some examples of what strong passwords do as opposed to not strong passwords. Um, but it's really less about creating an unhackable password because at some point in time, your passwords are likely going to be exposed. Um, this is just kind of the nature of nature of our how, how things are right now um, in the world. But I don't say that to scare you, just so that you understand that a lot of times it's a matter of time and uh, making sure that you're using different passwords for the different sites and places that you log into and the number of characters that you use, making sure that's long, um, longer than eight characters, which is the standard that most uh, most sites require. Um, so instead of making it eight characters, which is the minimum, make it 20 characters or whatever the maximum is for a site. Um, but really, the idea is that your passwords will eventually be discovered um, be sold, be shared, um, because there's so much that we can't control as individuals um, with what happens to company data, um, you know, and whether or not how the, how the companies handle that data. Um, so the, the good thing about this is if you, if you continue to change your passwords, um, then you don't have to worry so much if your password from 10 years ago uh, is out on is out on the website and published for someone to see because you've already changed it in your um, whatever site that site was. So the big thing is to you know if, if you find out about a breach that you go in immediately and change those passwords um, and then continue forward. Okay. So but these are just some suggestions. Um, I've also had folks and seen uh, suggestions of you know you maybe use a lyric of your favorite song. Um, but rather than using all the words, you just use the first letter of each of the words in a song lyric. Um, and there are, we are moving toward 
suggestions of past phrases, which are going to be things like you take three words that don't seem related to each other and you make up a story about those three words to make them related to each other and use those for your passwords. Um, the only issue with that is a lot of sites require you to use numbers and symbols as well as letters. So if, for example, your password was going to include the word um, light, maybe you would do an L and then for the I, you'd actually use an exclamation point instead of an I. Um, that's an option uh, and maybe you know, however you want to want to do it so that you can get something a little bit more complex, but that also satisfies all of the requirements for whatever site you're using. Um, I'm going to move on here. So you want to keep them longer. Uh, you want to make sure you're not using personal information. So again, that's why people are recommending past phrases um, that seem like they don't have anything to do with each other um, and are not. So you wouldn't necessarily want to use your you know, your first pet's name and then your second pet's name and your kid, the name of your, um, you know, your siblings or something like that. Um, you want to, you want to make it so that it's not necessarily something anyone would regularly guess or like a common phrase. You know, you don't want to use the word password as your password. Um, and then two-factor authentication, which is essentially using two ways to prove you are who you say you are. One is that you have to input your password. And then the second is typically that you either have a second email address or a phone or tablet or some other way to prove you are who you say you are. Um, usually it requires a passcode, you know, like they'll send you a five digit temporary number and you have to put that in um, to then have an extra step of security to get you into your account. Um, if you're having trouble coming up with passwords or passphrases, there are some places out on the internet that are um, random password generators where it will help you create uh, a string of words and numbers and um, things like that uh, that you can also use um, to help you come up with something that would be entirely random. Um, I use password generators all the time. Uh, the one drawback to a, pa a random password generator is, of course, then it's super random and you really do have to commit it to memory. And then, of course, you want to make sure you're changing these occasionally. So once you've changed it, then you have to learn and remember a new one. Um, so this is now where, before I move on to talking about autofilling, this is where password managers come in. And password managers are generally and typically companies that will allow you to put in your, basically put in all the passwords for whatever sites you're visiting. And it stores, stores them online in their cloud, their cloud service. Uh, and then can call it up for you uh, when you go to those specific sites. So if you're interested in password managers and learning more about them, uh, we can certainly point you to resources for those. We uh, here at the library, we don't preface one over the other for anything, so we can provide you. And there's some additional resources in our additional links page here um, on this handout about password managers. Uh, so you can read more about them in case you're interested in those. Okay. Okay, so now that I've said that password managers can remember all of all of this information for you, we're going to talk a little bit about um, your browsers. <laughs> so your browser can, and uh, usually by default, lets you save passwords in the browser, which means, you know, if you were going to go to your email and you put in your email address and then your browser says, oh, yeah. So I think this is what we had for it. We're gonna autofill it. We know this is what it is and it lets you write in. The problem with autofill is that if anybody else, um, even just from a physical standpoint, if anybody else uses the com same computer you do and you have that autofill password option, it's very easy for them to get into your accounts. Because of course, if they're physically sitting at your computer and using it for whatever they need to use it for, they can also easily jump into those things because they don't have to know or crack your password. It's already remembered. Uh, so you do want to consider whether or not autofill um, or autofill data in general is something you want to do. Um, <clears throat> this is what I mean by this is 
if you start to type your address in on a website where you're going to for for um, shipping purposes, let's say you're shopping online, you're going to buy a pair of boots and you go in and you put in your address and your name and your credit card information because you're going to buy it online. Well, your browser is going to say, oh, OK, I can I can remember this stuff. I can automatically um, sign into websites with these stored credentials. Um, and if you do that, then, of course, anybody else sitting down at the computer has access to those same stored credentials. OK, so you do want to be careful about whether or not you want to autofill the data. OK, and so this section here is examples for each of the primary browsers, Chrome and Firefox and Safari and um, Microsoft Edge for how to either set that or turn it off. So this next section is essentially all the things, again, that you can customize about your experience um, in whichever way you prefer. Okay, so for most of them, it's going to be under your settings and options and privacy and security. And I do encourage you to take a look um, at all of the settings that you can within your browser and take a look at and see if there are things you, you want to turn off or if you things that you want to leave on. So, for example, here, you know, with Firefox, if we look down here at forms and autofill, we have checkmark. Yes, please. Um, autofill my addresses. I don't have to type my home address every time I'm on a website. It can do that. Um, it can autofill the logins and passwords. Uh, but you again, you might not be interested in that. Um, think about it too, that if you, if you accidentally, if you had this all set up on your phone, where your phone and you're browsing websites and stuff on your phone, and then you accidentally leave your phone somewhere, well, that's a security risk, right? Someone could get into your phone and it's very easy for them to have access to all of these things. Um, in the past, I know a lot of folks would keep like a little black book of passwords <laughs> and just have them all written out. Um, and that's a lot like what the password managers do for you in, in today's world too. It's keeping all of them safe. Um, and you've probably heard the advice that you shouldn't write down your passwords um, and then you know, leave them out anywhere. So it is hard to remember a lot of passwords, especially when you need a different password for everything that you do online. Um, I do I do understand that. Most sites also have the ability, though, if you've forgotten your password, that you can say, oh, I've forgotten my password. And they'll send you an email with a temporary code that logs you in. Um, as long as you've, you've got that system in place, too, um, then if you forget you forget it you can still get back into those sites so but so this is something i recommend you take a look at whether or not you want to fill fill those things and have it auto generate okay any questions about that about auto generating no and auto filling okay 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 so i'm going to talk a little bit more about two factor or 2fa or two step verification um, essentially, this is an extra layer of security for confirming your identity whenever you're signing into something online. Um, and not just online too, but well, mostly when you're online. Uh, it signs you into a correct account with the correct username and password, and then also a code or notification sent to a secondary account or device to complete the login. Thus two-step or two-factor. You have to prove you are who you say you are two times, at least two times. <clears throat> so then you would enter the correct code or take the correct action to get into that first thing that you're logging into. So for example, this is something that um, if you have Google uh, Gmail, Gmail uses two-factor authentication if, if you set it up. And what happens is you sign, you go to mail.google.com and you enter your email address with Google and your password, and then you go to sign in and it'll say, <clears throat> okay, we can recognize that you are who you say you are. However, we're gonna send a notification to your phone and you're gonna just, it's gonna pop up on your phone and you're just gonna click yes. Or in some cases you have to identify that there's a certain number on the screen and you have to say that that's the number that shows up on your phone. Um, so this is something that uh, has already, it's been around for a long time in other, other forms too. Uh, for example, when you go to an ATM, you need to, also, you need to have your bank card or, and also your correct 
um, ATM pin code, right? So that's already two factors. You need to have the physical card and you need to know the pin number. Um, some other examples of what might be two factor instead of uh, pushing a button on your phone, uh, a fingerprint. So a lot of the newer laptops actually have a little, um, a little box down in the corner. Uh, and that's actually for a fingerprint, like your thumbprint. Um, you might have this set up on your iPhone if you, you, or your um, Android phone, if you use that as a way to get into your phone where it's gonna scan your fingerprint and then it knows that you are who you say you are because of course fingerprints are fairly unique to individuals. Uh, there's also face recognition. So you might also have this. I, generally that's with a phone as well. Um, or like I said, it could send you a temporary number and you put that temporary number in there, okay? And push notification is usually um, when it sends a notice to say your phone or another email address um, to help you get back into your account, okay? Any questions about two-factor authentication? It can be a little, go ahead. I was gonna say, I don't see any, but I think more and more um, companies are moving towards the two-factor authentic authentication. So a lot of companies are now requesting that you set that up just to give you that extra. Because of course, you know, like you were saying before, it's only a matter of time until your password is potentially leaked to somebody. And then yes. of course you would, you really don't have control over that, but you know, the hacker or whoever is not going to have access to your personal device. So they can't press that extra button in that two-factor authentication scenario. Yes. So, I mean, you never know what could happen in the future, but for now, I think two-factor authentication is tr really trying to prevent those things from happening with your password. Yes, and um, this is a good time to mention too that as soon as we have a method that seems safe, someone will come along and figure out a way around it, right? Um, but that's not to scare you, that's just to say currently, this is one of the most um, talked about ways to help protect yourself. And since it's constantly changing, that's why we run these classes, you know, we run these classes all the time and update with new information. Um, so the fingerprint example is fairly recent that um, computers are starting to also come with fingerprint um, readers. So, you know, we, we try to stay up to date on this, but again, nothing's 100%. Um, but these are ways that you can help minimize that risk. Okay. Someone so, does have another question. I'm not sure, sure if we can answer, but I'd like to pose it to you. Sure. Um, someone is asking, what's the likelihood that my cell phone number would be used for other purposes and or sold? Yeah. So we'll hear, that's a good question because, you know, if you're, if you're doing any shopping online these days, almost every place that you shop asks you to put in a phone number. And uh, in general, they're saying, at least the, the companies will say, you know, we're going to use this number to contact you in case there's a problem with your order. That's all well and good. And that's probably, you know, fine for the intent of the company. But if anything, you know, if they have a breach of security within that company, then again, you don't have control over whether or not that that you know, number might be sold on, you know, the dark web or whatever. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, I mean, we get scam calls no matter what. So your cell phone number is probably already out there in some form. Um, and if you get, you know, whenever, for me especially, and I think for most of us, if we get a call on our cell phone and we don't recognize the number it's coming from, I'm like, you can leave me a voicemail. I screen my calls. I'll look at my voicemail and if it seems legit, then I'll do something about it. If it doesn't seem legit, I'm going to ignore it. If you leave me a message and the message doesn't sound legit, I'm also going to ignore that. Um, so it is possible that your phone number, you know, will be part of a breach, just like your email address or password could be, or, you know, your credit card numbers or things like that. So it is, it is out there. It's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of it is that there are huge numbers of, of people trying to use any loophole to get this information. So, you know, we're, we're part of a modern world and that's just part of it. You know, if we're using these, that comes with it. Now, the person and was also saying they were asking in referral to two-factor authentication, would the cell phone number be used for a different purpose other than sending you? 
um, that push message or yeah, the it's code. good to. It's good to check the terms and conditions with the companies that you're that you're using the two-factor authentication with. Um, if you read through those, generally speaking, what they're going, most of them will say, you know, we're going to use your cell phone number to send these push notifications to you to alert you uh, when you know when you're trying to log into your account or when someone else is trying to log into your account. We'll send you. A notification. Um, there's also other instances too, where, for example, um, you know, with a credit card company, if you have it linked so that you get an alert on your phone whenever you spend more than a certain amount on your credit card, that's you giving your phone number to the credit card company for that express purpose. But it does mean that it's part of their, you know, their data that they have on you, or not on you, but for you, I should say. Um, so yeah, it can happen. Um, in general, I have not personally seen a case where my phone, to my knowledge, where my phone number has been used for another purpose by a company than two-factor authentication, if that's the purpose I gave it to them for. But again, definitely read through the, um, the terms and conditions of when you sign up for an account with a company, um, because they may have it in there that they're like, oh, okay, yeah, now our, you know, so-and-so can, can also use that number to send you text, you know, text messages about affiliated advertising or things like that. So it's good to check and make sure that that's not, that's not something that's also written in those terms. So, and um, Rebecca makes a good point too. Your, your data is currency. So your data is now currency for those companies um, that you're buying stuff with or that you're interacting with online. So anything that they collect they, you know, they will you. They can um, use it to target ads that specifically might relate to what you've looked at before, um, as a way to kind of enhance the experience of, with them. Uh, and there are some ways around around those too, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but it is again, it's just a really good idea, um, especially as more and more companies go to two factor. Um, because they're going to do that. Now, you if you don't want to use a phone, generally, two-factor will allow you to use an email address. So that's why I, I usually tell folks it's a good, in my, and this is my personal opinion, and of course, I caveat everything with, um, you know, not the opinion of the library specifically as an organization or anything, um, <clears throat> but having at least two email addresses with different companies uh, so that you can use those as recovery emails for your other accounts. So, and for two-step authentication or verification. Um, so if I'm trying to log into my uh, Gmail account and I can't remember my password and I have to say forgot password, well, the first thing they're going to do is say, okay, send, you know, you have a recovery email address. We're going to send a temporary code to that email address. I log into that account, get that number and put it in so I can get back into the first account. Um, so it's good to have that network in place. And that's also true with the two-factor authentication. Um, so you, in some cases, you can use your secondary email address as a form of two-factor authentication. Uh, but they are moving more and more toward phones because more and more people have a cell phone and it's usually a smartphone. Um, or they can at least send a text message to the phone to use that as a way to do two-factor. So I hope that makes sense. So, yeah, but I, um, I think, unfortunately, most of the stuff is trending towards you're going to need to have something. So you're going to need yes. to either have a phone with you. I mean, we see that at the library pretty often where people mm -hmm. are trying to get into their uh, to their maybe their Gmail account on our computer. And of course, Google is trying to protect them. So they're saying, hey, we don't recognize this device and we need you to, to give us that extra mm -hmm. security step. But, you yes. know, maybe they don't have their phone with them. So mm -hmm. that's that's unfortunately they're out of luck at that time. But that's something to think about as we move forward with technology is I feel like that's going to be more and more the trend. Yes, absolutely. It absolutely is. And, um, you know, there are other other security methods, too. There's even things called security keys where you basically carry around a key. And this is something for uh, that more often happens for people who maybe work for a company where there's protected data or it's like trademark company information and they need to insert the security key into whatever computer they're going to use as a way to prove that they are who they say they are too. So um, 
it's definitely we're definitely progressing in that direction where you will need more 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 things and more ways um, to confirm your identity for different tasks. Yeah, very true. Um, I forgot I was going to say something else. Um, I forgot what it was though. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but all of this is just to say that you know this is ways that companies and um, other organizations are trying to help protect you and your personal information um, to a certain extent. So, okay. any other any other questions about two factor? I don't see any so far, but I'll let you know if I see any. Okay. We had a good little conversation there. Yes. Well, and it's, it's I mean, it's it's very important to know that you know this is where things are headed. I used to give, I, I will say, I used to give out my, my, the uh, landline phone number, right, to companies. And a lot of times it was, you know, if they needed, and we're going to call about a problem with an order. And I've only actually had one company that I bought something online where they did actually reach out by phone to the landline to coordinate the delivery of the item. Um, mm. So it has actually happened. Um, yeah, it's but, never happened to me. But I'm going to say now that I say that it will. One, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to say that was one time in the last probably five years of buying things online um, where they actually did use that phone number um, to get in touch with me. So, yeah, yeah. Um, medical records are a good example of this, too. If you use um, like a portal, an online portal for uh, doctor's appointments or paying your bills online or anything like that, um, oftentimes they will have a two step verification process to get you in. And a lot of times it's going to be with the phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was trying to make an appointment recently. Um, and yeah, they had an option either text me on my phone or email me because, you know, they don't want people getting into that private information, especially with medical stuff. They send you records yes. often. So, mm -hmm. yep. And test results and are in exactly. that online portal. So you need at least the pass, you need the password and some way to confirm your identity to get into it. Um, you'll see this also with educational institutions like the University of Illinois and Parkland. Uh, you'll have, you can get to your email. So you type in your username and your password, and then they'll push a notification to your phone where then you'll log into your email using a code too. So this is definitely, definitely here and probably here to stay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so along the same lines, um, another thing to consider when you're thinking about being on the web is public Wi-Fi networks. So Wi-Fi is essentially a wireless technology that is used to connect devices to each other and to the internet. So for example, at home, you could connect a printer wirelessly with no cord to your laptop, or you can connect your phone to the internet um, through a Wi-Fi connection. Okay, so there are a couple of types of Wi-Fi. Uh, public Wi-Fi, which is something like, you know, you go to a, um, like the Illinois Terminal, for example. Um, it's a public building, uh, lots of people are in there, and they offer it as a, a courtesy service to you. Um, it is inherently a little bit less secure than a password-protected Wi-Fi network, for example, your home network, where you have put up a password and anyone connecting to the network has to know the password and put it in um, to then get to the internet, okay? <clears throat> now, you'll experience this other places too. So, for example, um, you know, if you go to like, Panera, I think Panera, for example, or any other coffee shop, really, um, and you want to use their internet and their connection to the internet, uh, you're going to basically you're using their wi their Wi-Fi to get to the Internet. Um, there's going to be a page that pops up and says, here are the terms and conditions of using uh, using our Wi-Fi network here at this coffee shop. And when you use this coffee shop Wi-Fi, they've got their terms and conditions and you sign. You say that's fine and you agree to it. And then it will give you a password and you will use that password and then you're on the Internet. OK, but some things to consider, even when you're doing that in a in a, a coffee shop or a hotel, for example, is you have to consider who set up the network, who's going to have access to this network and can they see what you're doing? And it's OK to go up to, you know, to go to a hotel and say, you know, how many people do you typically have? You know, is it is this network for all the guests in the hotel and their friends? Um, do I have a specific password that's specifically for my room in the hotel that's only for my room in the hotel? 
uh, and you can ask those questions, you know, and you need to ask those of yourself too before you get in there and um, do things. Now, you might also consider what sort of information are you going to access from say an airport or a hotel or a coffee shop? Um, are you going to get onto your email or um, you know, are you gonna look up things to do in the area or the, the, when the next uh, movie is? or you know, what the hours are for a certain restaurant. That's all stuff where it's, it's not your personal information that you're, that you're giving out to someone because you know, it's the thing, you know, like the times of movies published in the newspaper, right? They're also available online. Um, it's the, that passive looking something up but not sharing your information with someone. Um, if you were gonna do online banking and get into your bank account, uh, I would strongly consider whether or not I wanted to do anything like that on a public Wi-Fi network because you just don't know who else is there and who could be watching or kind of, you know, um, skimming your internet traffic, as it were. So unsecure Wi-Fi is a Wi-Fi network that does not encrypt data or have uh, many security features. This is something where m a lot more... Um, Wi-Fi networks have moved toward being more secure. Um, but if you don't know, it's probably good to ask. Uh, if you need a password to log into it, do you trust the company or business that's offering the network? Um, others can potentially see what you do and what you visit if it's an unsecure network without any sort of encryption. So along the same lines, and then I'll ask for questions. Um, when you get on a... Uh, a network, like get on the internet through a wireless connection or even a, a, even a wired connection for that matter. Um, you're the, I, there are a couple of different folks that can see what you're doing. Um, in general, if you see an HTTPS at the beginning of a website, that stands for um, hypertext transfer protocol and the S stands for secure. It means that they are, that that website specifically is using some form of encryption to encrypt your data when it's being sent somewhere, you know, and, and being used, okay? So the, you wanna make sure if it's, especially if it's anything where you're gonna be buying anything online, that, it, that those sites do have that HTTPS for you. Um, it should be, it's pretty, it's standard now. It should be on pretty much every site that you're gonna buy something from, um, it, from major companies to, you know, mom and pop stores that have a website. OK, um, there is something else out there called the VPN. It's a virtual private network, which creates a private online network off of an Internet connection. So the way I usually try to describe this is um, using the Roadrunner Wile E. Coyote cartoons, um, because what happens is if the Roadrunner goes through the tunnel and he sets up his, the, the Roadrunner sets up their VPN and then in the cartoon they paint over the tunnel. So it looks like the tunnel, but when Wiley e. Coyote runs into it, he just bounces off of it because it's like he's run into a wall. That's a little bit like what a VPN is trying to create. Um, it's, it's an extra level of encryption for greater privacy um, and to try to make it so people, other people that are on that network cannot see as much of what you're doing, okay? Um, they can be used across devices too. So on your computer, your phone, or your tablet, um, but they are not standardized. So you'll wanna research the companies. You'll wanna research the different options. Um, there are free ones out there. There are paid ones out there. There are advantages to the paid ones um, that are not available with the free ones. And again, remember your data is currency. So anytime you're uh, choosing something that's free, what you're really giving is information about yourself usually. So, so keep that in mind too. Um, there's a recent article in the New York Times it come, that came out in October where um, there was a discussion about whether or not VPNs are still something that's needed or if the um, websites and security has advanced far, uh, far enough that we don't need them anymore. Um, that is up to you to decide. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at VPNs, learn a little bit more about them. There's some resources in the additional resources page. And then you, you'll want to decide for yourself whether or not a VPN is the right option for you or not. Okay. Um, any, do you want to comment on that, Rebecca, at all? 
I think you covered everything. Um, someone also asked, are we sending a link to that VPN article? Yes, it is in the, in the additional resources section. Yep. Okay, that's what I thought I remember you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. And I just added that because um, that was not available to us the, in July when we last taught the workshop. So again, that's <clears throat> when, we, when, we read, when we teach these each time, it's because the information sometimes changes and then you get opposing viewpoints and opinions, um, even from the tech experts. So we always like to include uh, things that can help you be informed as an informed consumer of um, technology. And I think that's a good point, though, also about the opposing viewpoints is, I, I mean, you shouldn't take everything you read out there as totally the truth and what applies to you. So I think yes. it is useful to read those articles on both sides and maybe try to find a layman's view of something. So maybe if you're confused about what a VPN is or... I mean, anything really that you're researching, you probably want to get it in in your terms. Yep, terms that you can understand, exactly. So we're, we're kind of trying to be the, um, the gateway for you to, to start your, your journey, <laughs> as it were, um, into, you know, what do you feel like you need um, to have a successful experience online? So, okay, good, okay. Any questions? About that? Someone is asking, can VPN cause an issue logging into something like Netflix? Yeah, um, it depends on where you are. Uh, a lot of people will use uh, VPNs. So the general idea of a VPN is, is essentially that it, um, like we said, it creates that little tunnel for you. Um, but sometimes if you've created that tunnel and then your internet service provider um, can't see what you're doing or where you're doing and then yeah so it could um i don't want to say it wouldn't i don't want to say because again each vpn is a little different too and you'd have to figure out if it um how well it works with your different services and things so that's one of those where we'd kind of have to say um you'll have to test it and see <laughs> but in general they're not supposed to block stuff that you're already using um it's just supposed to create a little, um, a, a basically a network that that will um, give you a little bit more privacy um, from other people that are on that same network. Um, so yeah, the best I can say is you might want to look at, you might want to um, do your research and say, whatever VPN you're looking at, look up the company, learn more about the company, learn more about their privacy and security um, and their terms and conditions too. Um, and you know, do a little research on them as well to see if there's a lot of um, people that in the tech industry what, kind of watchdog folks that will call out companies that say they're doing one thing to protect your privacy and really aren't too. So that's why generally doing a, a search um, for information on different companies may help you decide that you don't wanna go with that VPN and you wanna go with this other one instead. Um, and uh, you could, you could basically Google Netflix, you know, login issues, VPN, so-and-so, and see if anybody else has had issues before you sign up for it. So, I think it's also useful to, when you're searching, check out news articles. So you can mm -hmm. sort by news articles and see maybe there's information about a merger of a company maybe, or, you know, people have come out and said X, Y, Z about certain companies. And you may not hear that from an article put out by... I don't know, certain websites that may be supportive of the company. So it's good to yes. see that or if there's a if, critical news article on something, you'll you'll may may find out more information about what's yeah. going on. And we can talk about, um, you know, the different thing, the different uh, tech industry blogs and people that, you know, that I, for example, follow um, pretty much on a day to day basis and the different sites that I follow that sort of do these watchdog um types of, you know, investigative journalism, shall we say, um, and checking into different companies and things like that. I'm happy to share, share the ones that I, that I look at um, with anybody who's interested too. So, okay. We could have a whole class just on that for, <laughs> for that matter, <laughs> just on all the, cause there's so much, there's so much out there. Um, and it is, it can be very overwhelming um, to, to know when it like, I also, generally say with tech, 
um, you don't know something until you need to know it in a lot of in a lot of time a lot of times in a lot of ways um, until you encounter something and then you have to go and figure it out or fig find out if someone else figured it out before you. Um, so the hope is that this stuff can kind of help you scratch the surface a little bit. Other questions? Great discussion so far. <laughs> I don't see any others so far. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna move on a little bit. Um, these are gonna be some fairly standard questions to ask yourself when you are assessing um, an email that you get, uh, links that someone sends you, or things that you may or may not want to do on social media. Um, and these are kind of, and I'm, I'm going to say, we kind of culled these from various other sources. Um, and it seems to be general across the board. Here are some things to ask. Okay. So <clears throat> if you get an email, oh, and I shall, I remember what I was going to say. Um, we have the Illinois Attorney General's Office coming in January, and they are going to present their internet safety and security class for us. Um, it will not be recorded. So if you're interested, I do encourage you to sign up for that. Uh, they will talk about some of this stuff that we're covering today, but go more in depth into what recourse, recourse of action you have and what the Attorney General's Office can do for you to help you should you experience things like consumer fraud or um, internet, you know, internet issues with a surrounding identity theft and privacy and things like that. Um, so I do encourage you to, to sign up and come to that if you want. Um, that will be one of our Monday night workshops. So it'll be at seven o'clock. I think it's the 28th of January. Um, Rebecca, can you check me on that? <laughs> Make sure it's the 28th. Um, yeah, let I me think, take a look at the calendar real quick. I think it's either the 28th or whatever the, it's either the second or fourth um, uh, Monday night. But I do encourage you to come because that one won't be recorded, so it won't be on our internet on our uh, our YouTube channel. Um, but they do give you quite a bit of good information. So okay, it's so, on the twenty fourth. Twenty fourth. Okay, thank you. Of January. I thought the, 20, the twenty eighth sounded wrong for some reason. So thank you <laughs> for doing that for me. Yep. Um, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and just dive right in here. Uh, and you can put in the chat too, uh, if you think of things that I have not included here or other things that uh, seem like red flags to you about emails that you get or um, suspicious links or things to watch out for on social media. I'm, I'm all about that. If you wanna um, add things into the chat that you, you've also come across or experienced um, that made you go, hmm, and you did like a double take before, before opening in a message or something. Um, so some general things to consider. What time was it sent? Um, generally, you can tell there's a date, uh, a timestamp on emails when you see them just in your inbox. More importantly, do you recognize the email address it's coming from? And you want to be careful here because sometimes you'll see that it looks like it's coming from a legitimate source like Amazon or something. Um, but when you hover over the sender's information and it's actually going to be a much longer email address or not say amazon.com, but amazon.somethingsomething.com. Um, so you want to make sure you recognize the email address and that it is a legit email address. So you can also go to the company page and say, okay, it looks like it's coming from accounts at so-and-so dot com and then go and look at so and so.com's website and see if their account information really comes from that email address or if that's the, per the email address you would contact. Um, <clears throat> is the subject heading something you and the sender have talked about and you're expecting the message or if you're not expecting the message? Remember, for most things, if you've initiated the contact, you've initiated the request, you've said, hey, I've forgotten my password, please send it to me, then you're expecting a message that says, okay, you forgot your password, here's a temporary code to get back in. If you just happen to see something that says, this is your temporary code to log in, and you haven't asked for it, then I would ignore it or delete it immediately. Um, because if you're not asking for it, they shouldn't send it, right? Um, can you contact the sender in an alternate way? So if it looks like it's coming from your Aunt Sally, 
can you call your Aunt Sally on the phone and say, hey, Aunt Sally, did you mean to send me this message with um, that has a subject heading that says cat photos? And maybe she did. Um, and maybe she didn't. <laughs> so it's good to check if it's at all suspicious looking. Confirm with the source if you can. OK. Um, another thing with that, too, especially with this before you open it, um, if you don't know the sender um, and it looks like something that's asking you to do something immediately, definitely take pause because, and um, they'll talk about this with the attorney general's office too. Generally, is if it's written to cause panic or to make you act instantly without thinking about it, it's possible it's a scam. It's possible it is too good to be true. And it's possible that it's not official and that's fishy. OK, so if it's asking you to do something, something immediately, for example, I frequently find in my spam folder emails that say that my uh, PayPal account has been suspended and I immediate I need to immediately um, reply to the email to get my account reinstated. I don't have a PayPal account. I'm going to ignore that right off the bat because I know I don't have a PayPal account. A lot of times it's not that easy. A lot of times you do actually have an account with the company. So, you know, if it's somebody from, for example, uh, uh, one of the streaming services, right? And they say, oh, your account's been suspended. Well, more than likely your account has not been suspended. And the thing to do is to go and log into your account with that streaming company first. Make sure everything looks okay there on your side before you ever respond to an email that comes from them that's not something you asked for okay that's the biggest thing make sure it's something you asked for okay um it's less common now that something would be poorly written um as the attacks from hackers and phishing um and phishing basically just like you know if you're casting a rod and you're hoping something will bite it's the same idea but it's spelled p-h-i-s-h -S when it's um an online phishing scheme uh if it's poorly written i take a pause if it's poorly written um, this is less common now because, of course, uh, attacks are becoming more sophisticated. So that's not always a clear indication anymore, but it might cause you to pause. Um, also, if it's it, written at like three in the morning or some random time, that doesn't exactly. seem right. Yep. Like in the beginning where it says before you open it, what time was the email sent? Because there's usually that timestamp. Um, hopefully, if it's, yeah, if it's like one or two in the morning. No, a lot of the um, companies that you shop that do shopping um you know i follow i uh i get you know the ad emails from some of the um, clothing stores and stuff and a lot of times i've noticed those get sent out at like two or four in the morning for some reason <laughs> and i'm not sure why <laughs> their their computer service generators are just running those at two or like 2 a.m or 4 a.m in the morning um, but again since i'm paying attention to the time i know that first but then i recognize the email address I recognize that I've already signed up for these um, and that uh, it's it's all a legitimate sender, basically. So, um, is the email asking you to confirm personal account information that you didn't request? So just like we talked about, if it's, um, you know, your account has been suspended, you need to do something to get back into your account. Don't buy it. Unless you asked for it, don't buy it. Okay. Um, is it asking you to download an attachment or click a link? A lot of times if you click links in emails, I'd be hesitant to click a link in an email unless you trust the sender. Um, if it's from a company, do you even have an account with the company? Like I said, I don't have a PayPal account and yet um, I keep getting all these emails that my PayPal account has been suspended. I don't have one, it's not me. Okay, questions about this? About any of this stuff with emails and links? Not so far. Okay, and there are um, there are some places. What I usually do if someone that I do trust, a sender that I do trust, I open the email and it's just a link. I'm gonna be. I'm. It's gonna cause me to pause a little bit, and I'm gonna look at that link and I'm gonna go, okay, what does it look? Where does it look like this link is coming from? Is it www.cats.com? Is it you know where is it coming from? Is it a lot of letters and numbers? Um, and kind of assess that a little bit. And then I might even go out and do a Google search first and say, you know, what is cats.com? Where is this coming from? You know, let me get some information about this company before I click on this link. Okay. 
Okay, so here's okay. So here's a little bit more <laughs> with the terms. Um, so fishing, like I said, is a, it's basically a form of social engineering. So the bad actors create and send fake emails that appear to be from authentic sources, such as a business or a colleague, and it asks you to perform um, either personal account confirm personal account information like a password, or it'll prompt you to open an attachment that will uh, infect your computer with a virus or malware. Okay. Um, vishing is a phishing attack that uses the phone or voicemail. Um, I don't know about you, but I've definitely gotten text messages where I've been like, I don't recognize this number that's sending me a text message and it's asking me to click on a link. Not going to do it. <laughs> Not going to do it. Um, you know, you may have opted into, again, like we've said, those, um, the two-factor authentication, it should be something prompted by you having said, I am enabling two-factor authentication. I am trying to get into this account. If you suddenly get something that just has a code or has a link and says, you know, log in here, but you didn't actually try to log into something, delete it. Delete it. You know, I get things from the vet for my for my animals, right? Um, because they'll they'll send me something that says, <clears throat> will confirm my appointment that I've set up for my animals. And there'll be a link there that says, you know, if you need to cancel your appointment, click click this link. Um, and I know that it's legitimate because I signed up for that service from my vet and I can tell that it's coming from the vet's um, text message line and that it has their information in there. Okay, so just be, be, be mindful of um, texts that you receive too. Okay, uh, smishing is again one that is carried out through those text messages. Um, so they'll send a fake text that appears to be from a business or company, um, and it's gonna ask you to confirm some sort of information with a link, okay? Um, vishing, a good example of vishing would be, I don't know if anybody else has received these recently, but there's a warrant out for your arrest. Anybody else get those? <laughs> I know I that the I- the IRS one sometimes. Ah, okay, yes. So these are some of the more common um, phone scams that happen where they will leave you a voicemail message and say, you need to call this number um, in order to get this warrant uh, removed, da, 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 okay? And I ignore those. If you're concerned, um, you can talk to the, uh, in the case of a warrant, you could talk to the local police um, and confirm that there isn't, um, probably. You can call the library and we can help you research um, some of the, if there's a company that calls you and says this is, you know, they give you the name of the company, we can call and, you know, we can um, do some stuff to try to help confirm. Uh, again, the Better Business Bureau is a place you can reach out to, um, and I have their information and in the additional resources as well. Okay. Okay, and also, um, this is not an exhaustive list of the types of attacks, these are some of the most common types of attacks that you'll see. Okay. Questions about that? Actually, before I move on, while I take a quick sip. I don't see anything. Every once in a while, too, I'll get a, a call. A lot of phones nowadays will um, detect like spam calls for you, and it will say like spam detected or unknown caller or something like that. And yes. sometimes I do get a voicemail from those and there may be like three seconds long and it's just like garbled. And then that's how I know I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to delete that immediately. Yes. Yeah. So, and when that happens, it's, it, it is, it's basically just, it's your time and effort to delete, um, to delete a voicemail message that isn't actually important for you. So it happens. Um, there is also a national um, do not call registry that you can add your phone number to. Um, the Attorney General's Office will talk more about that um, in January if you want to come to that um, and you can learn more about ways to protect yourself in, in that arena. Okay, so for links, uh, we talked just a little bit about this already. Um, is a link the web address you expect and or are used to visiting? For example, amazon.com versus amazon-deals.com. And I actually don't know if amazon-deals.com is legit or not. Um, might be a good a good homework assignment <laughs> to Google, you know, amazon-deals.com and see, is this a real site? What does it mean? Is it legitimate? Um, you can use link checkers if you go online and you go to, for example, Google and you, or, you know, Bing or um, DuckDuckGo and say, all right, um, 
you know, link checker, and you can copy and paste the link into a link checker, the link checker will usually flag ones that are suspicious or seem suspicious to give you a chance. Um, if it's a bit.ly or tiny URL, um, you may have seen these on social media like Twitter or Instagram, where people will use the shorter versions. Um, use a link expander, those do exist, um, and you can find them online as well to see the full link, and then you can see if it's actually um, coming from a company that you recognize too. Okay, uh, things to ask, how did you come across the link? Was it in an email that you didn't expect, or was it in an email that you expected and someone said, hey, I'm going to send you the link to this really cool article? Um, if you're entering, and this we talked about this just a little bit in the beginning, if you're entering personal information on a website, does the site use encryption where it has HTTPS versus HTTP? Um, if it's, you're entering any kind of buying or pretty much anything where you're going to enter some of your personal information, check for that HTTPS because that does mean it's encrypted or at least has some form of encryption. Okay, questions? I don't see any questions so far. Okay, I know this is, and this is a lot, uh, a lot to, to take in and a lot to digest too <laughs> with all of these possible things. Um, the internet is a lovely, wonderful place to be. Um, it's a great place to get information. Um, and, you know, you can always call us too and we can, we can look stuff up for you as well. Uh, but, you know, in today, today's world, I don't know how anyone would conduct things without at least having some um, interaction with the internet. So we just want to make sure the interactions are going to do what they need to do for you. So, okay, so the last part of the safety and security stuff that I want to talk about is um, social media. You really want to consider what information you're sharing on social media and social media platforms. And you want to make sure that you conduct a privacy and security audit on each platform to find out what you can control in your settings and what you can say, okay, I want this to be private, only I can see it, or I only want my friends to see this. And it's a good idea just to go through and, and kind of do that ahead of time. Um, and you wanna consider what you share because if it's out there, it's out there. Um, you know, if you reply to, and this was this was big at the beginning of the pandemic, I think more so than any other time, because we were all at home and uh, we wanted to interact with people. And so we were looking for things to do and people started to post, you know, things to get to know you better online. Um, like our little ad over here on the, our little image over here on the right-hand side. So, you know, you wanna play along, you wanna get to know people better, but once you put that out there on a social media site, someone can take a screen cap of it. Then they can give that information to someone else. If you do it in a group that's, you know, like say a Facebook group, for example, um, you don't necessarily have control over where it goes from there, right? So, and since a lot of people, and we know we're all good, good and uh, using our, our password expertise where we're not using these things as passwords, right? However, it's a good way for someone to start phishing to get to that point. They'll pretend they're a friend of yours and talk to you about your childhood pet. So then you think they're there, that it is actually your friend. They'll present that. And it's a way for them to get into your life and get you to trust them, even though they're not trustworthy um, and they're looking to get stuff from you. That's the social engineering aspect of it because it's on social media. It's getting, you know, social, being social with someone, getting information about them, and then using it for um, not so great purposes. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Um, and you want to consider what personal information you share. Um, it's easier for hackers or impersonators to gain access to your account or your friends if they know more about you. And lots of times I see where um, someone will take the uh, create a fake account on something like Facebook by taking a profile picture from someone, saving it, and then creating a secondary account and then asking all of their friends 
to friend them. And then once all of those people have friended them, then they get all that information about those other people because they can see what you've allowed your friends to see. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, any questions about that? No, not so far. Okay, I know it's a lot to throw out there, but it's all things just to be mindful of. It's, um, you know, it's sort of, I like to call it our, this is sort of our cyber savvy class where you're just being cyber aware. Okay, so speaking of being aware, there are some other things you should be aware of. Um, and those are things that can harm your computer. Okay. And you may have heard the term ransomware a lot in the last few years um, because, and, and we'll get to what that is. I'll go ahead and go in order. Um, but if one of these sounds the most familiar to you, it's probably ransomware at this point. Um, malware is kind of the umbrella term for all of these things. And it's basically a program or file that is harmful or used to exploit a computer or phone or tablet user, okay? So viruses, worms, adware, spyware, ransomware, it's all under that umbrella of malware. And malware can actually be downloaded without any notice. Um, generally speaking, if you're keeping everything up to date on your computer, your, um, you have an antivirus, uh, you have updates to all your, you're doing all your Windows security updates if you have Windows and um, the Mac updates if you have a Mac. Um, generally, some of the malware will, will be detected by your um, antivirus or anti-malware software, okay, and programs. Uh, but sometimes it can slip through, especially, uh, so that's why it's especially important to keep those up to date because as soon as a new one comes out, it's discovered, they send patches to the programs that you use for antivirus and anti-malware so that it can be detected to help protect you, okay? Um, adware is basically advertising supported software. So it's software that displays ads, um, often unwanted, on your computer or browser. Um, it typically generates revenue for the developer of the software. And it can be downloaded sometimes when you download a new, uh, new program. Uh, that then gets installed on a computer or a phone or a browser. Um, so the with adware, if you are downloading a piece of free software, sometimes that free software comes with some ad supported um, pieces to it because that's how the company will make their money is because they've partnered with an advertising agency or software group or company. Um, and that's why, again, if something's free, you got to know what you're getting yourself into, okay? Spyware is malware that enables a user to um, obtain information about you. Um, sometimes it's done by like keystrokes, like it'll record your keystrokes, um, I think, and transmitting data um, to their own device. Um, and you may have heard of, too of um, people being able to hack web webcams and things like that too. Um, those are all, that's like a version, that's a version of spyware. Um, and then ransomware. So ransomware is the one where basically if you've, um, it will encrypt and hold your files or the things that you have on your device, basically hostage um, until you pay a ransom to get them back. Okay. Now ransomware is usually, uh, usually targeting companies or cities. Uh, and you know, bigger organizations where there's a bigger, a bigger payoff for the bad actors who are doing it. Um, but it's good to be aware of it. It's good to be aware of the ways that you can um, prevent such things. Okay, questions about that? This is another thing too with apps. When you download an app from the app store for your smartphone or your tablet, um, it's good to research them ahead of time, just like everything else, uh, because sometimes those apps, if they're free, sometimes they do have things that come with them, like the adware too. So go ahead, Rebecca. I was going to say, I don't see any questions. Okay. Okay. And we're almost done, I promise. Um, <laughs> there's a lot to cover with safety and security, right? <laughs> so just to sum things up a little bit um, before we move on to the section about customizing your, your browsing experience, um, it, some things to consider. 
consider your setup for internet access. Are you on a home Wi-Fi network where you've password protected it? Assess an email before you open it. Evaluate a link before you click it. Consider what you're what you're putting out there on social media sites that others might be able to access because once it's out there, it's out there. And um, consider proactively protecting yourself from malware with antivirus and anti-malware software and programs and keeping things up to date. Okay. Any more que any questions or comments? I don't see any. Okay. Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit then and talk a little bit about customizing your browsers and settings. So, when you use your Windows 10 computer, you can set what's known as a default browser. And the default browser is going to be the browser that will automatically be used whenever it's op going to open a web page or when you click on a link. Okay. So, in this case, if I was checking my email and I was using the Firefox browser and I clicked a link in my email, it's generally going to open with uh, whatever the default browser is. So, if my default browser was set to Firefox, it would open with Firefox. If my default browser was set to Chrome, it would open in Chrome. Okay. Um, typically, computers already co come at least with one browser already installed. Um, if it's a Windows 10 machine, it's going to be Microsoft Edge. Um, if it's a Mac, it's probably going to be Safari. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Rebecca. Yeah, it's point. Safari. Okay. But you can choose to download a different browser if you want and make that your default. So, and it's generally a good idea to have at least two browsers on a computer. Um, it's one of the things that you, that I most often see with troubleshooting for stuff on the internet is trying it in a different browser, trying it in a second browser. So, and that's up to you. You get to, you get to choose whatever you want. If you only want one browser, that's, that's your choice. If you want to download a couple browsers, that's your choice. Um, you can you can customize that a bit. So the next couple of slides are basically um, how you can customize your experience by setting a default browser in Windows 10 or with Mac OS, okay? And um, again, just make sure if you don't want to use the, the what's already on the computer and you download a new one, make sure then that you go in and you change the default after you've downloaded the new one because you won't be able to pick it if you haven't downloaded it. Okay. Um, would anyone like me to actually go like do a quick demo of setting a default browser? I don't know if ours will let us because it might it might be locked down a little bit in here <laughs> in the office. Um, but generally, these these instructions are coming directly from Apple and directly from uh, Microsoft with Windows 10. So should work. Okay, any questions about about that? Setting a default browser? No, I don't see any. Okay, the next thing you can set is you can actually set a search engine specifically. So with um, each, the next four slides are each of those major um, browsers, Microsoft Edge, uh, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari and how to set a default search engine. You can use whatever search engine you want. Um, I've got a couple here, uh, like Google and Bing, Yahoo and DuckDuckGo. Those are by no means all of the search engines that exist, okay? So if you have a search engine that you like better, please feel free to use that one instead. But all you have to do is essentially follow the instructions for setting a search engine. Basically, you open your browser, um, click on the three dots, usually on the right hand side, and then go in your settings. And then usually it's in privacy, in privacy or search. And then under the search engine used, you can specifically select it. Okay, so here, for example, in Edge, there's a pull down menu here, where you can you can pick Bing, Yahoo, Google or DuckDuckGo. Or you can pick a different one that you want. Okay. Okay. 
same thing with Google Chrome. Um, they also give you Ecosia, which I actually haven't used, um, but as an example of a search engine that you could select. Okay. So if while you're out on the out looking for things, you you find that one is better than another for you, this is how you could set it as your default. Okay. Any questions about that? About setting a default browser? No. Or search engine? Okay. Uh, you can also set your startup page. And that means whenever you open your browser for the first time, it's going to go to a specific set of pages. Here at our library, we have it set so it'll go to champagne.org. That's the home page for the Champagne Public Library. So whenever the computer starts up and someone goes into the browser, it's going to go to champagne.org first. Um, for somebody who really likes, say, uh, the day's headlines um, for news, maybe they'd pick, you know, CNN or, you know, Fox News or whatever, you know, organization they get their news from their choice, but you can do that. You can open a specific page or pages on the startup. Okay. And that's how to do it with each of the browsers. Okay. Um, extensions are uh, small software bits um, that are used to customize your browsing experience. Um, browsers typically allow for various extensions, um, including ad blocking, cookie management, um, and cookies are cookies are essentially little little temporary files that give a little bit of information about what you're doing. Um, so, for example, if you're on a shopping site and you leave some stuff in the cart and you want to kind of track with the prices and see if the prices change, the cookies keep track of of that. They keep track of that. So then, when you go back to the site, um, you know, you go do something else and come back to the site that the shopping cart is still full of the stuff that you that you'd put in there. Okay. Um, most browsers have an online store where you can find available extensions. For example, here's um, a screenshot of the Chrome Web Store. Uh, they do potentially pose a security and privacy risks. You do want to, again, just like what you do with your smartphone apps, research the companies that put them together, go out on the internet, see what other people have said, um, check out what what their gate what these apps need access to or these extensions need access to in order to function um and what kinds of permissions they they look for okay um they're running in the background most of the time while you're on your browser so for example like with an ad blocker an ad blocker is going to remove ads from whatever site you're on so it might make the browsing the experience of reading or browsing a little nicer um because it's going to take those flashing things off the sides and and all that um but it is running all the time and what have you what is it what data is it collecting on you that's the other question to ask okay questions about extensions there's several i mean you can you can do things like um oh i'm trying to think of some extension let's you know what let's um let's go out to the example the chrome store and see let's see i'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and we're going to go to chrome okay so for example here's chrome and we're going to go into the google ah helps if i type it right okay so here's the chrome web store i'm hoping you can all see that it says chrome web store Yes. OK, so if I go into the Chrome Web Store and I can see all the different extensions, um, there's definitely some games. Um, there's stuff for shopping where it'll tell you where the, you know, what place has the best price for something um, or give you rewards for things. Um, screen captures, um, changing your browser to dark mode if it doesn't already have a dark mode. Um, I was curious about Tabby Cat. I saw that and was like, hmm, um, a new friend in every tab. Interesting. Let's click on this and see more about this. Okay. Let's see. It runs offline. Okay. What do you do? Let's see. Uh, it's an extension that brightens your day with a new animal in every new tab. Okay. So the cats blink and sleep and let you pet them just like real cats. 
All right. So if you just need a little a little cat um, to be in your browser, there you go. You can get a little cat to be in your browser. Um, there's also, of course, things for productivity um, and shopping, languages, working from home. So you get the idea. There's quite a few things out here. Um, I'm just gonna show you a little quick. So you can put like a weather extension up there. Um, you get the idea. Any questions about extensions? I don't see any. And okay. um, I should point out that some web browsers don't do extensions. Like I believe Safari Correct. on Apple does not have a lot um, in terms of like what you can customize on it. So I don't think you can add extensions, but I could be wrong. I haven't tried in a really long time. Um, yeah, it, look, it, it does. I mean, it looks like there are more developer things, which means people who are doing the coding and the behind the scenes and making them. Um, yeah, usually if I want to use an extension, I'll go to something like Google Chrome, which you can still get on, get on an Apple computer. So it's not like you don't have access at all if you have a right. if you have an Apple. Yeah, and a lot of stuff you can like uh, Rebecca was just saying, you don't have to necessarily install it as an extension if you can find it as a website on its own too, um, and then you can avoid having it be an extension. Sometimes uh, you see people's web browsers and they have like 50 extensions on theirs and it gets a little distracting. Yeah. So, it you do. know, it's up to you what you want to do and what yeah. works out for your workflow. And some of that stuff is now integrated into um, like Windows 10 computers. So you can put on your little taskbar, you can put the weather wherever you are, the how you know hot or cold it is and um, if it's cloudy or whatever. Um, and it's right down there on the taskbar. So you don't have to have it in your browser because it's right there. So, um, and that's a, you know, so you can put them in there if you want. Some, you might find some useful. I just uh, wanted to mention it so that you're aware that it exists um, and you can research further if you want. So, okay. I'm gonna head back to our PowerPoint here. Okay. Uh, the last part I wanted to talk about was cookies, since we've just mentioned cookies. Um, unfortunately, they're not cookies that you can eat. Alas, um, you know, Cookie Monster would be a little disappointed. Uh, but the cookies do keep track of things like shopping carts or recognizing a device if you're returning to a site that you've been to before and keep track of preferences. Um, they also do allow companies to serve up targeted ads customized to you. So that's why if you, sometimes people will say, you know, clear your history, clear your cash, clear your cookies um, to make something work a little bit better. Um, a lot of sites now will tell you that they use cookies and ask you to accept and consent to store the device information um, before you visit the, the website. So for example, that's this one here where they're like, we use cookies um, and you click accept and then, you know, and then you delete them. You can delete the temporary files um, that cookies create. Okay. And you can say yes or no. Okay. Um, private or incognito browsing mode. Uh, this is something that all of the major browsers do have as an option. Um, and incognito and private browsing mode basically are designed to help you from being tracked in a way um, for those cookies and um, internet history, but it doesn't stop your internet service provider or your ISP or your employer or school from seeing uh, where you've been online. It only keeps your local browsing private. Okay, so keep that in mind. So it is incognito or private, but there are still um, the overarching bodies that can can see it. Okay, so um, it, it basically what it, these, um, sorry, I'll go back for a second. When you customize it in Edge, this is what it means. So that link takes you to a description of what in private browsing tabs do or do not do uh, for your um, internet experience. So again, when you're picking what browser you want to use, if you want to consider uh, whether or not it tracks your browsing data or deletes the cookies or does these certain things, um, that may influence your decision of what browser you want to use. Okay. Um, 
and Chrome has Chrome is is called incognito. So, okay. Questions about private browsing mode? We have a question about cookies. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So someone is asking what happens if you don't accept or reject cookies, but just ignore the noticed. Yes. Ignore the notice, sorry. So in most cases um, with the sites that do pop up with that, you have to either accept or decline. So if you accept, then uh, you're, what you do, that's, it's a great question. Um, what you do on the site uh, may be a, a better, more customized experience for you because you've allowed the cookies. Um, if you say decline or don't accept cookies, uh, and you continue on to the website, you might find that there's very little difference. Um, it's just going to depend on the site. So I recommend trying it both ways and seeing what happens. Um, if you're concerned too much about cookies too, again, you could come to a place like the public library where our computers, you know, they scrub after every person and whatever you're looking at, as long as you're not logged into something like an account, uh, with some service, it won't track you. So you could come into the library, you could, you, you know, you could look up, you could shop, you know, do your browsing shopping um, here at the library and then go home and actually purchase whatever you want. Um, but it won't, while you're here, it won't be generating ads that then you'd see the next time you came to the library. <clears throat> so yeah, there's no, there, there isn't a really good way to answer whether or not accepting or declining cookies will um, like derail your view to a certain website um, because they're all so different. Um, so you'd have to, you kind of have to try it and see um, if it breaks the functionality or not. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better, <laughs> a better, more concrete answer for you. Um, they said, thank you. Yeah, it just kind of depends on what site you're going to. So if it was a shopping site um, and you had built a cart and then you said, okay, no, I don't want you to accept cookies. It's that's going to really affect um, the preferences for those carts and what you can see in those shopping carts. Um, if you don't accept cookies for something and you're using a device that you've used before to visit the site, it may not recognize that your device has already been there and make you go through whatever process it did the first time, the next time you're on it. Um, uh, but for some, it doesn't make it barely, it's, it's barely noticeable um, that you've declined cookies. So just kind of depends. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a good example of a site to go to where declining the cookies actually makes a huge difference. Um, that's a good thing. I'll, I'll see if I can find one and we'll put that in the follow-up email um, when we send it out so you can kind of um, experience the difference. I'm gonna make myself a note there. Okay, because that's a good good chance to see it in action. Okay, other questions about browsing or private browsing or incognito mode? I don't um, see I, any so far. Okay, and again, that's the same is true for your smartphones and tablets too. If you want to use, um, you know, Chrome on your um, your tablet, you can also do incognito mode on your tablet. Okay, very quick troubleshooting tips and then we're all done um, for today. Uh, keeping your browsers updated is going to help you to um, have all the protections that you can. Clearing your cache, your cookies and your history. And uh, we covered clearing cookies and history last week. Uh, so if you want to take a look at that, uh, part one video, once it's up on YouTube, we do cover how to do that in the different browsers. Uh, again, having more than one browser on your computer is usually going to help you when you need to troubleshoot, because if something doesn't work in one browser, you can try it in the second browser. Then you get an idea of whether or not the browser was the issue or if it's the site itself that's the issue. Okay. Uh, you can also test your internet speed. So if, for example, you're watching, um, say, like a Netflix movie or a Hulu or something on a streaming service like Canva, perhaps, which is uh, available through the library. And you mean Canopy? 
sorry, yeah, Canopy. <laughs> Canva is not available for Blackberry. Sorry, Canopy or Hoopla. But thank you, Rebecca, <laughs> where that came from. Um, <laughs> Canva is a is another site that is um, for designing uh, like social media posts and um, holiday cards and stuff like that. Um, you can get a free account through Canva and we do have classes on Canva here at the library, but Canopy is a streaming service that you can get for free through the library with your library card. <laughs> um, but you can test your internet speed. So if something's lagging and it's taking a long time, you can use something like speed test uh, to check if your internet is actually fast enough and what your, your rate is going at. And this is also a chance for me to put in a plug for our intro to streaming class, which is um, next week. And at that class, we will talk about even more about ways to troubleshoot um, for the streaming and talk about the different streaming services um, that exist out there and setting all that up. Okay. Questions, more questions? Any, okay. I don't see any. Okay. Our additional resources page, like I mentioned, um, it's got stuff about password managers and VPNs coming from consumer reports, um, some information from the Better Business Bureau about social media scams, and Digital Learn, which has some information about privacy and then getting on a website. Um, the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission, about cookies and Wi-Fi networks and phishing emails and kind of how to how to detect those phishing scams. And then GCF Learn Free has a section on the internet as as a whole. Um, so that goes back to the the first class a little bit too about navigating and searching. Um, browser extensions, Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, here is that New York Times article uh, about VPNs. And it's all about our VPNs worth it. Now, in this particular article, the, the writer then sets up their own VPN and controls it. That is something that someone with a lot of tech um, knowledge could probably do if they wanted, um, but maybe not the general public. So just keep that in mind, too. Um, and then PC Magazine has some stuff on password managers and cookies and VPNs as well. And then Wired had some stuff on. Uh, safety tips for when you're using a public Wi-Fi network that I wanted to include. So I know this is a lot of information, a lot of talking today. <laughs> um, when we run this class in person, hopefully in uh, the next session, which starts in January, um, we'll still be online for January and the beginning of February, but then we'll be in person um, from then on. And we will run this one where we actually have activities that we do where we'll go in and actually change browser settings and explore uh, those things that we can control. Okay. All right. Um, before I actually, before I talk about the upcoming workshops, are there any other questions? Um, does anybody want to ask a question out loud? or have any comments um i'm we're here to we're here to help so whatever you whatever you want to share i'm not seeing anything so far okay well i know for me sometimes i have to i have to decompress after something too <laughs> and then i'll come up with questions later uh so feel free to reach out to us um at uh, my, my email address is swinkler at champagne.org. Rebecca is rvandusen at champagne.org. Um, she can put those in the chat for us. Uh, you can also contact the library directly um, or reach out to the librarian at champagne.org um, to get help. And of course, we can do our book of librarians, which half hour to an hour of staff um, helping you with whatever your technology topics are that you're interested in. Uh, upcoming workshops. I mentioned we have intro to streaming services on the 14th. Then on the 28th, we'll talk about how to find and listen to podcasts. Um, so if podcasts are something kind of new to you, you might be interested in attending that workshop. Uh, we will do some demos of podcasting apps that you can use and also talk about where you can find recommendations for podcasts that you might want to listen to. And then in January, um, for those of you with Apple computers, we do have a new workshop. Uh, we have Getting Started with Apple Computers, which we've run once before, I think, Rebecca, is that right? Once or twice? I think we've run it twice now. Okay, twice before. Um, and we have added a new class in files and folders, 
with Apple computers specifically. So it complements our class that we teach on Windows 10 files and folders. So um, if you have a Mac, a Mac or an Apple uh, device, you're welcome, or Apple computer, you're welcome to come to that workshop as well. That will be over Zoom. Um, and it will be recorded and it is the first time we're running it so we're very excited to see if um, people are interested in that one and then we'll have um, intro to cloud storage and intro to pinterest and that rounds out january okay so then here uh, again is my information feel free to call or email me um, if you have any questions i'm happy to happy to help i'm happy to help research some stuff uh, and you know help you out we do have our webinars on YouTube. Um, so if you go to champagne.org slash YouTube, you can see all of the previous webinars that we've taught um, through Zoom. Uh, basically back, um, I'm trying to think when we, we started back in, was it June or July, I want to say? I feel like it was of, maybe like August. Yes, yeah, summer of 2020. 2020. Yeah, it was summer of 2020 that we started um, Zoom workshops. And we do put the new updated versions um, higher in the workshop list. So, you know, like this one will go up and it'll be at the top of the list. Uh, so if you want to skim back through the list, you can see some of the of the other topics we've covered. Yeah, and I should say, even though we're going in person, those videos are still going to be on YouTube, so you can always um, look back at those. And we will have, um, I believe every month we will have one webinar, so they won't be completely in person. Yes. So that way, if you do prefer the, um, the online Zoom environment or the uh, web-based workshops, we will still, we have heard from folks that they do, there are some folks that appreciate this format uh, more than the in-person format, so we're going to try to do both. So, okay. And then uh, again, book a librarian, half hour to hour of help with a staff member. Uh, you can also reach out to us via live chat when the library is open or email us at librarian at champagne.org. Okay. And I think that's everything I have. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and remove my spotlight here. Yep. There you go. Okay. Um, and I put and in, our emails in the uh, in the chat. Yes, and um, for those in-person workshops, we will we will until um, the library no longer requires uh, masks. We will have masks, um, and I'm trying to work out where I can get captions across the project projection screen too, um, so it's a little easier to understand folks. Um, and it'll be in our usually in our upstairs our upstairs room here, and uh, we'll do what we can. So. And, it's new uh, for us too. Yes, and January, January will still be online, um, which I also decided that might be good because of weather. <laughs> it's really cold <laughs> if you don't want to go out during the cold and um, you know possible snow or whatever. Um, we can still run run classes that way. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank All you, right. everyone. Glad. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody. And hopefully, we'll see you next week. Bye.